Listening to the Career Musician Podcast with creator and host Nomad. With 20 plus years of experience in the music industry, Nomad has done just about everything to earn a living as a career musician. From being music director to celebrity artists, playing iconic arenas and stadiums, composing for film and TV, and even playing your average local club gigs, he's done it all. Nomad's mission is to empower musicians across the globe with strategies for a sustainable career while blasting stereotypes and to bring you tried and true wisdom from his colleagues in this crazy business we call music. Welcome to another episode of the Career Musician Podcast. Today, I have one of my personal heroes, Wadi Watel, session guitarist, touring guitarist, composer, producer, songwriter, singer, artist extraordinaire with a legendary list of credits. How about the Everly Brothers, Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor, Bonnie Raitt, Randy Newman, Don Henley, Jackson Brown. Oh, how about Keith Richards, Stevie Nicks, just to name a few. Check out everything that Wadi has to tell us, man. These are the stories of gold for us career musicians. And let me tell you, he is the epitome of that title. Sweet. So, I mean, Wadi Watel, what an honor. Seriously, man, to have you on the Career Musician Podcast. Bless your heart, man. Thank you very much. It's very sweet. Man, as as I was telling uh, 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 Danny uh, Korchmar yesterday... Cooch, right? Uh, yeah. Your good buddy. Like uh, you guys, you guys are the cats that I look up to, man. Like you, you know, you you're the cats. You know, <laughs> it's wild, isn't it? <laughs> it's wild to have moved here and see other guys be the cats, and you know, forty years later, it's us. You know, it's yeah. it's pretty uh, pretty extraordinary, really. I met these guys, you know, a long time ago when I got here. I'd see, I, I moved here in 68, okay, so I'd see Russ Kunkel, Lee Sklar, Danny Cooch Korchmar on these albums, and I'm going, who, who the fuck is this guy Cooch? Why is he getting all this work? You know, I, I decided, I came out here with a band, but I broke it up, and, and I met a couple of studio guys, and I went, oh, shit, you know, I think I could do that, I could play that, I can play as good as, well, almost as good as them, I don't read that well, but my ear is very quick, so... And uh, and I started working, and then I'd see Steve, keep seeing Cooch's name. Who is this guy? I hate him. You know, I fucking hate this fucking guy. Why is he getting all this work and I'm not? And uh, man, that's exactly how it goes, isn't it? Yeah, sure, of course. You know, and one by one we all met. You know, I met Leland first, then I met Russell, and then uh, a producer I was working for had had me play for David Foster, who was the new guy in town. And the next thing I know, Lou Adler called me to play on a date. And I show up to this date, and there's Russell and Leland and Danny and Foster and me. So fucking, so finally, Cooch and I met, and we loved each other instantly, of course. There you go. <laughs> and we've been right. brothers, brothers since then, so all Yeah, I, and like I was telling Cooch yesterday, East Coast, man. So originally from New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jackson Heights, Queens, yeah. Now, nice, Queens. I'm from Long Island myself. I was going to so. say, I hear it in you. Where are you from? Where in Long Island? Uh, Suffolk County, a little bit out east. Comac and Northport. Comac, okay, yeah, sure, yeah. I had, I've got Wachtels and uh, various Jews spread out all over the island, you know. Uh, nice. Great, Great Neck and uh, Rockville Center, all those, all those places. At least they, that's where they were, you know. So cool, man. All right, so, so now you guys are together in, in the immediate family, right? And yeah. it's, your, it's your new band, couple years. You're going strong. Yeah, yeah it's great. It's, it's I mean, great. so yeah, I mean, let's talk about that. First of all, Jack Pyatt says hi, the uh, producer oh. for the film. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, Jack, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, brother, Jack. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's the one that connected us with Lisa. Oh, is that so, right? Yeah, he's yeah. great. I love him, man. He's a good lad. Big shout out to Jack and Lisa. Yeah, good people. 
So, I mean, it's fantastic. It's got to be exciting. It's like uh, it's like a reunion of sorts, but it's not because you guys have been working together forever, like you said. So Right. Well, you know, we, we for years we were in different uh, situations. You know, Leland would be out with Phil. Russell would be out with Maya Lovett. Danny was in the studios. and Well, Danny was living back east for a while, so he was completely gone from here. And then uh, and I was on the road with Stevie Nicks. I've been with Stevie forever, so... So we, 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 would event, we would occasionally wind up on a session together. You know, we'd come back to town and everybody, you know, one of us would be with one of the others. But uh, now we are together always and it's fantastic. It's unbelievably great. That's so awesome. I love, I was telling Cooch yesterday, I love watching the videos of you guys playing. You know, and even now with the COVID crisis, even in the midst of it, you guys are keeping it up. I love the streaming videos oh, thanks, that you guys yeah. are doing. Fantastic, man. Thank Fantastic. you very much, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're trying. So, it's, it's crazy, you know. It's, I know, it's a tough time. It's a sick fucking time here. <laughs> I know. But you're hanging in there. You guys are doing it. So, all right. So the single's coming out, though, in a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The single for Quardo Valley is coming out. Uh, Cruel Twist will be great. We're just uh, putting finishing touches on a video right now for it. Nice. Cool, cool. So you guys are excited about that. We're very excited about it. I mean, it, you know, it's so, it's just unbelievable how the world turned on us because we finally, the four of us and the five of us with Steve Postel, the band is an incredibly strong unit. And here we are, we're doing it. You know, we finally were able to dedicate our lives and our time to something together and shut down. You know, everyone, I mean, not just us, everything, every venue, every avenue for any entertainer is door slammed in your face. You know, we had gigs, gigs lined up, you know, picking, picking gigs, picking this, looking at the new year and everything is like slam dunk now. But, but yeah, the record, the album, the whole album and the documentary, which Denny Tedesco is doing on us, which is another incredibly great turn of events another reality that one wouldn't expect to happen um right. everything's on hold now you know so everything hopefully yeah. by the beginning of next year yeah. both things right. will simultaneously come out that's our plan but we're very happy about and quarter valley love us and we love them they've been great with us though so it's fabulous that's awesome that's awesome all right this is the perfect segue so uh, as the name kind of says the career musician podcast you know, we've been, we're, we're, we're lifers, right? We've been doing this forever. As a lot of us say, there is no plan B, right? This is... No, there is no plan B. Yeah, you got plan A and you stick to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there is. You know, I never learned anything else, so right. I wouldn't right. know what else to do. Uh, and you don't, you don't retire in this business. You know, you, you play till you can't. You know, right. that's, that's how it is. I mean, you just don't, you don't just say, ah, oh, I've had enough. You never have enough, you know, you can't, you, you, you open up every day and you hear a song and you go, wow, what's that chord or something? You know, you got to, if you're learning every day, then there's no stopping and there's, there is no stopping, you know, every, every, every day there's a, another trick that someone else laid down that, you know, 30 years ago, you've been trying to figure out and all of a sudden it makes sense to you and you go, oh, that's it. You know, it's like, you know, learning that Keith played five string on all those early Stones early Stones records, you know, not early, but like from Honky Tonk on, you're, you know, you're always going, gee, I'm playing this song, but it doesn't sound right, you know, and I'm, I know I'm playing the, every note in the chord, but it doesn't sound right. <laughs> it just is not right. Which string did he end up taking off? Was he taking the low E off? Low E was gone, and it was an open yeah. G, open G tuning. Open G, yeah. wow. Yeah. So cool. And it's extraordinary, because like, that's, that was Bo Diddley's tuning, and, and, when I worked for the Everly Brothers, which was my first gig out of Los Angeles, I spoke to Don Everly one night about the intro to Bye Bye Love, which is still one of the most magnificent things you've ever heard in your life. And that's him, by the way, playing that. And, and I, said, I said, Donald, you know, I've been, I've been playing guitar my whole life. I just don't understand. What is that? He goes, oh, it's just this, just this G tuning that Bo Diddley showed me. I went, what? 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 <laughs> Wait a minute. First of all, I went, you know Bo Diddley? <laughs> yeah, Bo Diddley showed you this? Yeah. And uh, and then I went, what? And he just put his guitar in the tuning 
and he slammed the intro at me. I went, oh my God, it's you, isn't it? He goes, of course it's me. I went, oh, boy. Okay, all right. So, so again, the, the focus here is like, talking about making a career out of music and we're always faced with obstacles, right? So I think this this distancing thing is just another os- obstacle which we're quite already akin to. We're, we're, we're used to it, right? We've built up stamina to, to, yeah. to, to obstacles. I said that thing, you know, uh, humans, we adapt. We, we right. adapt to anything, you know, like you, you stub your toe real bad or something and, you know, and you're limping for days and then... After like two days, you go, oh, well, I guess I limp now. You know what I mean? You just, that's it. You just adjust. Okay, from now on, I'll just limp. Fine, whatever. Yeah. Next. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you come back to, oh, it's gone. Great. Okay. I, but yeah, we adapt. Absolutely. So so with all of, with your, with your, the legacy, I call it like a legacy list of credits, right? I mean, you just said it. I and mean, I don't want to dig in a little bit, but, you know, the Everly Brothers, Keith Richards, Linda Ronstadt, and all the cats from the section, and and James Taylor, and Iggy Pop. I mean, the list is crazy. Did you experience, and this is what I want to share with listeners who might be able to, uh, you know, identify with it, or it might be like an encouragement. Have you experienced the ups and downs of the industry? And how have you dealt with that, you know? Of course I have. I mean, first of all, it's like, if that phone isn't ringing, I'm dead. It's still... The same way it was after the first week I started doing uh, record sessions. You know, I would do a date. It went well. And then I'd come back to the place I was living and the phone ain't ringing. And I'm going, oh, my God, I'll never work again. I'll never work again. And the phone rang, another session. Phone rang, another session. But and even in the thick of the, the fat years of touring, like with Linda, where we were on the road constantly. Back then, you were really on the road. You were out for months at a time. Right. When I'd come home, that phone ain't ringing. I'm, I'm scared to death that I'll never work again. And it's still that way. <laughs> it's still- Isn't that a trip how we always do that? That the, the anxiety builds inside and we feel that, you know, that, that tension? Yep. And, and it, it also, you know, you got to get used to the word No. You got to get used to the word no, that it's not a final thing. It's just an opinion. It really is because, I mean, at first, you know, we, we, had, we tried to get record deals. We had record deals in this band. And when we broke up the band, my girlfriend, Judy Pulver, and I were pursuing a record deal. And they said, well, we like the songs, but, you know, we don't like your voice. So I went, oh, okay, fine. You know, <laughs> at first I was really crushed by it. And then I went, oh, well. That's just him, you know. Maybe someone else likes it, you know. That's so right. You gotta get past the word no, and but yes, you you experience those ups and downs. Uh, hopefully, you don't. But in my life, like I said, even in the thick of times, when you're home for two weeks and you haven't had a phone call, you're scared. I'm scared to death. Yes, I'm. I'm so glad to hear you say this because yes, I can identify with everything you said, and I think lots of others will so it's really nice to know that you know we're kind of all in this together in that sense oh absolutely right i even asked uh, i grew up a a guy who is now a plastic surgeon and we had dinner one night in new york and i said let me ask you something and i went through this exact topic i said for me in my business if my phone ain't ringing i'm scared to death i'll never work again is it like that for you he goes absolutely he goes, are you kidding? A patient leaves and they don't come back or they don't call me again? I'll, I think I'll never work again. It's the same. Every business is just about the same. You know, you are, whatever it is you've chosen to do, just keep doing it because there's going to be dry periods. There's going to be, and I hope there aren't, you know, and that'd be, then, then we'll all go eat at that guy's house. But, you know, until <laughs> then. That's what I always say. The drinks are on that guy. <laughs> exactly. Where are we eating, man? You know, but that's the, yeah, that's it. That's uh, so awesome. All right, so so you start in New York. You come out here. I just wanted to touch a little bit. Look, I mean, the, the point, everybody can go to your website, which is beautiful, by the way. I love all the information. Uh, Nina did a great uh, job there. So it's, uh, the home page is wadiwachtelinfo.com. Yes. And, of course, the spelling is W-H, W-A-C-H-T-E-L. Correct. That's last correct. Name. And two that's D's right. in Wadi. Uh, so, but the bottom line is everybody can Google you and look at all your stuff, right? It's all there. So I don't want to cover all of that here because you've covered it a million times and, you know, but are there any like key moments throughout your career of working with these, 
uh, you know, uh, legacy acts uh, uh, that stand out to you? Any moments like you mentioned the Linda Rodstadt tour, uh, you know, anything like that where just like, oh, wow, that's really helpful. You mentioned Keith Richards and the Everly Brothers and so forth. Well, those are all pretty standout moments, you know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was... Throughout each each one of those things, there's there's been incredible moments. It's like, for example, with Linda, after after doing a lot of sessions in, in in L.A. here, most of the time when you're doing a date, there'd be someone, either the the actual artist would sing what they call a guide vocal, or there or someone else would go in the booth and spit out a, a guide vocal for the band to play to, then the singer would come in and sing the tune, you know. With Peter Asher and with Linda, when I got into that circle, which was, which was later for me, um, Linda was singing the vocal when we played the track, like Blue Bayou. That's her live vocal. So you're all going down live with yeah. the artist together. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's fantastic. And it makes the band that much more aware, first of all, and, and, and much more attentive to what's happening. It's just the greatest. I was so knocked out by it. I went, wait, she's going for it? He goes, yeah, we're, this is it. We're going for the vocal now. And oh my God, that's fat. That's fucking great, man. That's awesome. So was that one of Peter Asher's kind of MOs that he liked to cut live to, to capture that yeah. essence, right? Yeah, yeah. that, was, that yeah. was the difference. When I started working with Peter, that was the main difference was that the the lead vocal was going down when the track went down. So Yeah, that's ballsy, right? That's yeah, the, it is. And it makes it so when the singer has hit the peak performance, that's the take. That's the take. Ah. So have you ever... I mean, just to hear you say those words that, yeah, when we were tracking Blue Bayou, I mean, that song is a freaking legendary <laughs> song and you're the guitar player, you just say, ah, I'm just doing my thing, you know. Talk about that, man. You've played on so many legendary hits, you know? Yeah, well, it's wild. I mean, that's, you know, we didn't know. I didn't even know that song. And I know a lot of tunes, but I didn't know Blue Bayou. And we got there and uh, said, this is the tune. And Dan Dugmore played that that steel solo is live on the date. You know, Don Grolnick's beautiful electric piano, Ricky Murata on the drums, Kenny on the bass, and Linda. And that's it. And, and I played acoustic on it. And... Uh, Played my old fat J two hundred, and and everybody just did what what you hear, is what actually went down, from start to finish once the red light was on on that take. I don't even know how many takes we did on it. I don't think we did that many takes on it because Linda hit that vocal. It was like incredible, and Dan's solo was perfect. So. Yeah, and then talk about that symbiotic energy, right? It's just when you hear an amazing vocal, that just makes you yeah. more excited to create beautifully, it right? It sure does. It sure does. Uh, another example of that for me, which really blew my mind, was I uh, did an album with Bob Seger. And and again, you know, you're used to guys, you know, not pouring it out on the lead vocal and stuff. And this is like a 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning session. Bob, he goes in that booth, man, and he is like, like he's on stage. It's 9.30 in the middle of the night. And he's in the middle of a show somewhere in an arena, putting out so much energy and screaming this vocal out, you better play good, you know? It was unbelievably inspiring. Man, I like that. Again, you just get chills hearing about that, man, you know? So a lot. what's, what's really interesting, I find, you know, I've been playing my whole life. I play guitar as well, and, uh, you know, again, you're one of my heroes, man, and we actually know some of the same cats. Um, but what's interesting is when we talk to our friends who aren't professional musicians, right? We all yeah. we all have civilian friends, as we call them, <laughs> regular people. Uh, they always, what's that? I think we do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they always find it awe-inspiring how we can just go in, you know, like you say, go in the booth on a date. By the way, I love the vernacular on a date. I had to explain that to my daughter. When we say a date, that means a recording date. Oh, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. So when we go on a date and we go in the booth to play, that's our job. So we can create instantly at the drop of a dime to whatever the producer and the artist and whatever direction we're getting. A lot of people who don't do this professionally don't understand how that works, you know? Yeah, that's the job. Yeah, you and they expect you to come up with the goods. And that changed that you know, that changed from when I first 
again, from when I got here, things were a lot more, uh, I don't know if organized is the right word, but there was much more attention to paper. You know, things were written out for specifically being done this way. And I, I remember, and I was always being told, don't go for solos. You know, you'll overdub a solo. Don't, don't go for a solo. Just keep playing rhythm. And don't change your sound while you're playing and the, all these things. And I, I was just going, but, but that doesn't work for me, you know. And, and I, I would have this, I get inspired, you know, that word inspired. I get inspired. I'm hearing something go down. And I'll hear in my head as the solo part's coming, I hear what I want, what should be there, you know. So I would just go for it and people would you know, they'd stop me a couple times or, or they'd go, man, you shouldn't have done that, but that's great. You know, that's really good. And don't, you know, don't play here, but I'm hearing it. So I would, I would start doing it. I would just add what I heard. And, and eventually that's why Russell and Leland and Danny and I, and all of our friends, Bob Glob, Jimmy Keltner, to every, every, every one of the guys that I've had the gift to know, uh, are that way. You know, they, give you their heart. Every time that, that red light goes on, they give you their heart and they give you what they hear, not what what was expected of them to do, to follow. They give you. And that's, and with Peter's sessions, it, more and more, that's, that became what was expected of us. Here's the song, go play it. You know, there was no, here's the arrangement, here's the arrangement, here's the song, go play it. You guys figure out what to do and hurry up and do it. It's a beautiful thing because, like you said, we're called upon to create this music instantly. But at the same time, the rules, there are really not any rules. The, the, rules, the, the, rules, the rules got bent. The rules definitely Yeah, bent. they got bent. So now it's on you, yeah. which is a beautiful thing. When we did, uh, for the, the Linda, doing Warren's, Warren's song, Poor Pitiful Me, we didn't know what to do. You know, and I'd already recorded it with Warren and I'd played it so many times with him. I knew it couldn't yeah. go that way. And then Dan grabbed the acoustic and Ricky played that drum beat. And, and I just sat there. I didn't even play till like the first solo lick comes in. I didn't play a note. You know, I just waited and waited. I said, it's not right yet. I, okay, I hear that, oh, 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 is me. Rang, come in right there. You know, then I could start being part of the band. And you'd let it just be a trio for a while. You know, it, it's, it's, it's great how music builds itself and how a trio can sound gigantic, and then you add a couple of more elements and it's like an orchestra. You know, all of a sudden Don Grolnick is playing this, like a rhythm guitar part on the on electric piano. It's like stabs, great stuff. It, it's wonderful and, and I'm able to counter rhythm it. It's, it's tremendous. It's so awesome. I was watching you guys with the immediate family uh, translate some of the songs that you guys had all written and played, you know, back in the day. And a lot of the stuff, especially like Cooch was saying, the Don Henley stuff was on keyboards. Yeah, yeah. But you guys were transcribing it for guitar and playing it. It sounds so cool. It brings on a new vibe to it. Totally you know? different vibe, yeah. Yeah, so beautiful. So one of the things I love talking about is studio etiquette. And basically, we're covering it now. Because, like you said, there was these stringent rules that everybody said, it has to be this, it has to be that. You know, over time, things got bent. And now everybody has home studios or on, on their laptop, wherever they're working in the park or whatever. You know, throughout the years, you've seen studio etiquette change up and down. But if there was maybe like one or two golden rules of creating in the studio, what do you think that would be? Perhaps for some younger people coming into the game, you know? Well... You know, the 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 song that you're about to play, that's all that matters. What you're doing is is supportive to that melody and, and words. The lyric, you know, I learned after a long time that people don't listen like like musicians listen. People are hearing the words first. They really are, and because I know, I learn songs. At, uh, phonetically, I, I know so many. I know the lyrics to so many songs. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but I know if they sound right and I know if I'm singing them correctly, but the song is what matters. So the etiquette, that etiquette is just to, you know, shut up and listen to the song and go out and 
counterpoint is our life. That's 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 the basic life of, of, a, of a company and an accompanist, and find a simple counterpoint to to work against the melody or to support that melody. Aside from that, there's not much else. You know, keep your ears open, be ready for uh, comments that are going to come flying at you. Don't be too uh, wordy, and pay attention. You know, pay attention to that singer and that song because that's all it's about. You know, I, I always say, I, eyes and ears wide open, mouth shut, right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, I love that. I love the, the counterpoint reference. That's so true. Well, that's it. That's our life. I mean, and especially for me, when I, what I do on records is when there's a space, I'm looking to fill it. You know, I'm looking to take up the slack where that melody left off and just put a little ear catch in there something you know it's like my first the first thing i did with peter asher was my my dear dear friend jd souther's record um and and there was a song called simple man simple dreams which turned into linda doing simple dreams and peter didn't know me at that point and didn't want to really um <laughs> he had his circle of guys and jd said you got to play on this and i saw peter go oh man and, and I always had my guitar and my volume pedal with me in the car. So I set up and I heard this song, Simple Man. And after his first melody, I heard a spot for just this simple little steel lick. This is like a little, like a, like a B-E kind of thing in the key of E. Uh, da -da, just like that. But it was the right thing. For, he goes, what if I fall in love with you? That up just like common. And Peter went, whoa, what's that? You know, and that's what I mean. You, you look for the counterpoint. And when you're in a lead guitar role, which I always hopefully put myself in, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take up the slack when the, when the vocal stops. You know, add something. Oh, I love that. I'm, I'm, it, people can't see me because it's an audio podcast, but I'm smiling cheek to cheek. This is crazy because, <laughs> yeah, man, everything you touch is magical. I love that. And you do you do bring that magical little counterpoint, and that's what it's all about. Again, I feel the same way. When I get in the booth as a guitar player, I play a lot of acoustic and, and electric, but I'm always trying to find that little sauce, right? That little extra. So, yeah. Wow. I love I love chopping it up with you. Just hearing about that. <laughs> cool. All right. So so look, we're shifting from the, the studio. You've done. I mean, and every time you talk about something, again, the legends just pop pop pop. And what's great about recording is that all the work you've done is documented. You know, so we could say, oh wow, that's you. That's you. You played this. You played that. Move that now over to touring. Like you said, you did a lot of touring, especially with Linda. Yeah, well, I've done a lot of touring, period. But I mean, in back general, then, right, right. The, the amount of time you spent on the road then was was <laughs> extensive. Let's put it that way. You know, you'd go out and you wouldn't see your old lady for like two months, you know, easy. Right. So, easy. You know, the... quick, little, quick little weekend fly dates weren't really a big thing. Back yeah, then. no, that, uh, that weekend warrior thing wasn't exactly happening quite yet. But right. Steve, and Stevie and I have done you know, tons and tons of months and months and months and years on the road yeah and steve nicks now and you you have been her musical director right yeah so okay that's awesome so let's talk about that i love that so being on the road touring being an md and a guitar player break that down for some people who might not be aware of what you know it's involved being a music director md is the new term for band leader and that's that's all it is and i've always seen myself in that role uh, unfortunately for some other band leaders too because i i can't unlike the studio where you know in the studio you got to like watch what you're saying you got to be careful you know you still get your opinion across but when it's on stage it's it's the spontaneity is going to happen so you got to be ready to pr to produce it the correct way so i'm a little more uh, verbose about being on the on the stage and being a band leader is I've always been in that position with guys. I mean, I, I, I learn songs very quickly. I know how they go. And I, I always think, I always think I know how they should go, you know, despite someone else might not agree with me, but that depends on who's the band leader at that point then. Uh, but that's it. MD is, is band leader. And 
I, I like to think of myself as a good band leader, and I find it very important. I always tell people, I'm going to rehearse you guys and us until we hate these fucking songs. We're going to know this fucking shit so well that when you get on that stage, you're going to fucking play it right. You will be playing it right because you can't stand it anymore. You know it backwards and forwards. That's how many times we rehearsed it. Which is, and it's funny because I just realized with, with the winos, it was completely the opposite of that. We never rehearsed. You know, we, really? we had so few rehearsal days. But that's an ex incredible uh, assemblage of musicians. That's a whole other chapter right there. That's like, you know, but, but in general, like with Linda's band, I would, I would always get myself in that role. You know, Andrew Gold was the band leader when I joined. But after, after a while, I kind of took over that position. With James, James is a band leader. James is a band leader. Linda wasn't a band leader. You know, she was the singer and she wanted it right. And she'd tell you what she wanted. And she was the one picking the songs always. But James was more, you know, more, he was a player. So he, he'd tell you what he wanted. And, so like James uh, Taylor didn't really have a, a band leader per se. It was him. It was him, yeah. 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 But he would still, you know, Danny. And when I got to James, Danny was still pretty much running things under James. Okay. You know, but then like with, with Stevie, I've been the band leader. Gotcha. That's it. And, and I rehearse bands to death. And also, I'll tell you another thing. This is something I, I, I live by, and, and I suffer from it like we all do. You go out on tour, and you do your first show, and it's killer. It's fucking great, okay? Then the next night comes, and everyone has this air of, yeah, we got this, man. We got this. We got this. And you go out, and you suck. You fucking stink because you think you're good. And my point is, <laughs> I always say, nobody's good at anything, really. You know, and it only comes through really giving it your all. So, and, I'll, I, I, and a lot of times I'll forget it. Like night number two, I'll forget my speech, which I usually wind up saying afterwards. When we come to the dressing room, I'm going, I want you to know, myself included, we stunk tonight. Because we all went out there thinking we're so good, we got this covered. We don't have it covered. No one ever has it covered. You got to go out like it's the first show every time. Otherwise, that's what happens. Amen to that. Man, as, as you're sitting here talking, I can replay moments in my memory that are like, wow, oh, man. Right, you know, oh, man, we got the, oh, God, I stink. I can't fucking move my hand even, you know, I can't play. <laughs> Uh, so I was I was the MD for a baby face for ten years. Oh really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, that had to be challenging on some level, I would think. It was it was definitely challenging, but it was a huge learning experience. And everything that you're talking about, I can identify with wholly, and I love it. And I find myself I love that word by the way, verbose. Great, great. <laughs> I, I'm the same way, you know. And like you said, I've learned to to read the room and be careful, especially in the studio, you know, yeah. or especially when somebody else is producing or, you know, or you're right. working under other people. But when I get on that bandstand and it's, you know, even though it's not my band, but it's my band up there, right? It's on us. We have to make sure that it goes off without a hitch. Yeah. And whether it's Linda or James or Keith Richards or Babyface, looking back, they're looking at you. Yeah, if you get that, you know, that look, you get that, that look, look, that ain't good. That look ain't good. You know, that's the worst look, right? It ain't a good look. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the pit in your stomach, you know, you're just like, oh, <laughs> yep. man. So I love it. I love to hear this. Wow. So, OK, but I love the antithesis of when you're so well rehearsed with Linda or with somebody else like that. And then when you're with Keith Richards. It's like totally the opposite. Talk about that. It was, it's bizarre because we, when we started, we didn't even have that many songs, really. Our, our, first, our first gig was Saturday Night Live. That was our the debut gig. We never played anywhere before that. That's amazing. Yeah, it was pretty wild. 
and you know we there we are and and i gotta say i love seeing that performance both those songs we look like we've been together forever on that show you know we'd never played on a stage in our lives together and we got together the night before you know we went through some songs you know went through the songs a couple times when we went to do the album we didn't we knew take it so hard and we knew struggle a little bit and uh we just learned the other ones. We just, it's just, the Stones is a very different world. Uh, it's, it's different, but, and so to, what's funny is, at one point, Charlie Drayton had to leave us, and, and we, he was replaced by a, a great guy named Jer Jerome Smith, a terrific bass player. So we actually, we rehearsed. We went into like days and days of rehearsals you know, going over these tunes, going over these tunes. And it finally, we finally got to, there's a, a reggae tune called Too Rude that we do. And we started to rehearse it. And I just went, all right, hold it. Can't he find his own fucking way through this fucking song, for God's sakes? Do we have to rehearse this too? Let him find, it's three fucking chords. Let him find his way. Come on, we ain't rehearsing this one. Come on, let's can we have something loose up here? We became so tight, and it was great too at the same time. But it was like, can we have a break here? Come on. <laughs> That's so cool, man. <laughs> wow. Hey, this is Wadi Wachtel. You're listening to the Career Musician Podcast with my good friend Nomad. The Career Musician, empowering musicians with strategies for a sustainable career. Binge previous seasons of the Career Musician Podcast and subscribe for all new episodes. Hey, let's talk about this. As a career musician, well, first of all, I know that you're, you're not only a guitar player, you're a composer, producer, songwriter, singer, you know, artist. But as a career musician, let's just, let's just start with being a guitar player, right? Whether it's on a session date or on a tour or whatever. Most musicians don't have managers, right? Just as a, as a musician. So how have you dealt with your business? Because I love talking about business acumen and trying to show the next generations coming that, look, this is a business. And if you don't have your shit together... Well, I was told early uh, I needed an accountant. Um, yes. You know, you need a business manager because I am an idiot. I don't know how to, you know, I, I, I can, I can write checks, but I can't, I can't keep a check log. Uh, so that was, I, I, I know I, I didn't have anything for anyone to manage. You know, I was, I was a session player who was getting calls and a, man, a manager's not going to go, you know, you don't, it's not like you have an agent looking for sessions. So you don't really right. need a manager per se when you're, when you're a musician on, you know, doing session work, but but as we started touring, everyone was saying, you got to have a tour manager, uh, not a tour, excuse me, a, a business manager. Someone's got to take care of your bread or you're going to spend it all. And they're right. So I've been blessed to get that information early enough. And, yeah. and at one point, I, uh, we took the, the backup band for Linda, Dan Dugmore and Rick Murata, Stanley... Uh, well, Stanley Shell, we added. We we made a band called Ronin, and at that point, we were we were starting to get we were starting to get besieged with a lot of phone calls, a lot of offers. And at one point, I think it was even prior to Ronin, I I, I took Peter Asher aside. I said, you know, I'm getting a lot of people calling me about stuff, and I I don't know what to do. I mean, would you consider managing me? And he goes. He said, well, you know, yeah, I've always, I've always been a, a Wadi fan. I went, oh, really? I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. So Peter managed me for a while, and then he managed Ronan. He took on Ronan. Um, That's Ronan awesome. never really took off. We, we came out at a wrong time, and uh, okay. it just didn't go. But, so Peter was managing me at that point. But I still, you know, we, we now have management for immediate family, but individually, I, I don't have a manager. You know, I, uh, okay. I have my business manager who I've been with forever now, a long, long time. And, that's, and that really helps, like you say, because that's not our area of expertise. Yeah, and, and a, lot of, lot of, um, a lot of calls and, and 
communications that I get will go to him rather than come directly to me. So he'll say, do you want to deal with this? Do you want to deal with this? So he, in a sense, is like a manager uh, on, sure. that, on that level. Sure. All right, but now let's talk about the nuts and bolts of deals per se. So there's two things I want to talk to you about. Subbing and when to say no thank you. So what, do you, what is your creed for, for subbing? How do you, you know, how do you deal with subbing? You mean finding someone to sub for me or subbing yeah, for yeah. someone else? Yeah, whether, else. like if you have to find a sub, if you're like, oh shit, I, I'm double booked or I, need, I wanna go take this other thing and I did this and I committed, you know, how do you feel about that? What do you do? I name very few people. Dan Dugmore would be one person I, I've asked to sub for me and I've asked, I think Danny has maybe yeah. subbed for me, but it usually doesn't come up. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a rare, that hasn't come up for me that much. I think I, think I, I asked Doug Moore to do something once because I couldn't do it. Um, so I, I'm not that versed in that one, really. I don't know much of that because normally I, I just say, no, no one's going to do what I do, so fuck that. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, nobody can sub for me. Uh, I love that. That's, my, yes. that's my, my main opinion of it. Yes. I tried to, uh, and uh, we were doing this uh, party every year with Adam Sandler. Uh, he had this great Christmas party, and we would have this amazing band, and we would host a, a, an array of great artists every year, a bunch of great people. They were from Joe Walsh to Jackson to Lindsey Buckingham to Eddie Money, my dear late friend, to so many people. Vanilla Ice, who's a great guy, by the way. Uh, incredible amount of people Dennis from uh, Styx uh, Dennis the Young from Styx who blew us away uh, anyway and this is the longest set of the year uh, like you know we do like three hours of uh, incredible amount of songs and Adam Killen singing his ass off amazing but it got to uh, we did it for like ten years in a row and finally there was a year where I was going to be gone with Stevie and we were going to be in, I was in Australia or New Zealand. And, and I said, I just can't get there. But I could, you know, how about, you know, this guy, how about this guy? And Adam just went, no, no, if you can't do it, we're not doing it. You know, so it's not, I, I'm not the only one with that opinion of myself, thank God. Because he just yes. said, and I said, well, you know, this guy could really do a great job. He goes, no, it's got to be you. That's fucking awesome, bro. Come on. Pretty cool. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. All right. So, how do you deal with uh, you presented with a, a gig or an opportunity, and you have to say no, thank you? How do you deal with that? Or, you know, what what are the what's the criteria for you to say yes? Being available, first of all, you know that's a lot of it. That, that would usually be the only. A musician turning down work is, <laughs> it's foolish, right? well, is a very rare thing, <laughs> you know. That doesn't happen that often. I mean, it usually comes down to that you're just not available to do it. Uh, so saying no is very, very uh, wrong. Well, see, and it's funny. The reason... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just said you, you don't... You try not to say no. You, yes. uh, because it, and even if... For an example, even if it's like a gig you don't even want to do, you know, it's like... Someone calls you and it's some guy you don't like and you know, you can't even imagine what the song piece of shit song is gonna be. But you say yes and you go there because you never know. Someone could be walking by that studio at that moment and hear something you do and stick their head in and go, Who's that playing guitar? And boom, there's your there's the connection you made from instead of saying no, being on a date you don't wanna be on. So Using using the, using the word no is a lot different than getting used to being told no. Well said. And the reason why I bring this up is because I do feel like the, uh, a lot of the newer generations need to hear this truth. Because we, I don't think we're at liberty to say no. Like you said, it's like, hey, you say yes to everything because you never know where the next dot is going to be connected. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, people have called me and said, do you play piano? I go, yeah. <laughs> sure yeah what do you need you know uh, the first gig I ever did for Linda Ronstadt I got called by Kenny Edwards was, was my late friend Kenny was the, the bass player for Linda for many years and he was sick one time 
and his manager, Norman Epstein, called me. And this is, I hadn't even met anyone yet. I knew my friends, Kenny, I knew Andrew, but I wasn't in any kind of situation. I was doing sessions. They said, well, you're the only person we could think to call this and ask this of you. Could you play bass uh, tomorrow on <laughs> two shows for Linda? And I went, yeah, sure. And I hung up the phone, I went, how do you play bass? I don't know how to play bass. <laughs> You know, I don't know these, and I don't know these songs. Yeah. But nonetheless, you know, you say yes to everything. You don't say no. <laughs> and you made it happen, didn't you? You sat down, learned the book, and bam. Yeah, well, I faked it, you know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, saying no is, that's not for uh, an up-and-coming musician to do. That's a word you don't want to be using too often. That's right, that's right. I love it. And, and, and that goes back to our faith muscle. Like we say, yes, we figure it out. Just like we have the faith to know that somehow or another, the phone keeps ringing. Right. Yeah. 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 And that, and that you will figure it out. You know, you, you'll somehow, you'll get through this tune, you know, somehow. <sighs> Man. So one of the things I love to ask my guests is, you know, some of the principles and methods that you adhere to. I always say that, you know, the principles remain the same. Everything that we're talking about over the decades, the principle of it is always the same, even if the methods change. Is there anything, I mean, and you just dished out so much knowledge for us. It's beautiful. Is there anything else you want to add to that? I mean, you know, surviving as, as a professional musician, of course, now it's crazy with, you know, the COVID thing, but just in general, anything else you want to add about that? I would imagine long before COVID, that it's a lot harder to get somewhere in the music business that when I did it, I, I happened, I, it's so funny because I couldn't, New York was a closed door. I didn't, I'd been playing guitar since I was nine years old and I couldn't get into the sessions and, and I couldn't get into a studio in New York. I was even, I was afraid to even try to walk into a studio in New York. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know how to break into anything. Leslie West and I lived in the same building. I was Leslie's teacher. Leslie got a record deal. The Vagrants had a song out. I'm still sitting in my apartment in Forest Hills going, what am I going to do? I can't get anywhere. I, you know, I can't walk into these sessions, these studios. And, and I got the opportunity to come to California. And when I did, in 1968, it was our... Liverpool. It was the most incredibly musical period this country's ever had, I think, because everything it was happening in Los Angeles right then. The Eagles were just forming. Crosby, Stills, and Nash were just being put together. Jackson was coming up. Everly's hired me. I met Warren there. Um, Linda was doing her thing. Little Feet was playing. Uh, J.D. Souther was doing his thing with Souther, Hillman, Fure. Then it was J.D. on his own. David Cross, everybody, and Don and Glenn, when we were doing Warren's Excitable Boy record, Don and Glenn would be at the session, come by, just, you know, hanging out, have a beer, have a drink, have a smoke, whatever. You want me to sing something? You need a, a guitar on this? No, it's cool, man. Or Don would sing on something. Everybody was in everybody's musical life, sharing it. It was this wonderful exchange of thought and love and music and if you weren't playing on something then you were at someone's house writing something or, or just fucking off and playing shit but everybody was so musically linked together we were we were doing the song excitable boy and i decided i heard in my head i wanted to hear these beach boy backgrounds on it so i said i need these beach boy backgrounds on it what am i gonna do what am i gonna do Hey, Linda, what are you doing? Nothing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on Warren's record, and I want to put this Beach Boy background stuff down. You want to come sing with me? She goes, yeah, let's call, call Jennifer Warren's, and the two of us will come down, and the three of us will sing it. And that's what you hear on that record. That's the three of us singing those backgrounds. And everybody was just, oh, yeah, sure, I'll be right there. Everybody. We, we, everybody was in everybody's music. It was this glorious shared experience that's not like that now oh the it's, camaraderie is gone yeah. yeah that doesn't happen everybody has their own first of all recorder in their house set up in their house everybody's on their own 
nobody is, 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 it's not that brotherly thing going on now. So, and also studios are much less likely to open their doors to someone new. I don't even know how I got in those studios, really. I mean, I wound up on a session, then I wound up on another, and then I wound up on another. And all of a sudden, people knew me, and it, it just went like that, you know, but I don't... I, I was... Oh, I'm sorry. What? I was just going to ask you, uh, the studio culture, that's when all the studios were thriving. So yeah. so, so what was that like? Talk about some of the... I mean, you, from Capitol on down, Ocean Way, I mean, tell us about that. Well, it was... It, the studios were... That's the word, thriving. I mean, there was... We were doing two, three sessions a day. You'd go, you know, I'd start off in the morning with Russell somewhere. I'd go to an afternoon session. Leland would be there. I'd come back. And then the third session that night was Stevie's first record. You know, we did uh, Edge of 17. Um, you know, that was the third session of the day for me and Russell. You know, and you'd go from Studio 55. You'd go to Capitol. You'd go to MGM, which was on Fairfax. You'd go to Ocean Way. You'd go to Conway. You'd go. They were everywhere, and every at Wally Hyder's Studio Three, every studio was rocking and booked like crazy, and it was that's what it was. And that's not like that's that now. You know, it's different now. Talk about that when you're doing th two or three sessions a day consecutively, and the work was really just rolling in, like you said. The the calls were just they just kept on stacking up like dominoes. At the end of the day, so you go in for maybe a six or seven o'clock in the evening. That was your final session, right? Uh, yeah. Well, you, you know, you start at ten, two, and four or five, something like that. You'd finish okay. about, you know, eight, well, because some session, nighttime sessions would go long sometimes too. So, but yeah, you'd usually finish around eight, nine o'clock. Okay. And what do you do after eight, nine o'clock? You first of all, you must be exhilarated because of all that creative energy, right? Yeah. Then what? Yeah. Well, it was, you know, I'll give you a funny example. I was working one day, and there's a studio where we all spent years called Record One in the Valley. And so Record One, I used to call it my favorite bar <clears throat> in town. So on my way home at night, I'd stop at Record One, have a drink or two, you know, come down a little from, like you said, being exhilarated from working yeah. with the, all these different people. And you could just go there and chill out for a little while. So, but I walked in one night, and... Val Gray, the great producer, sees me and goes, oh man, I can't believe you're here, that's perfect. He says, we're doing this song and you gotta play on it. And I went, oh, I don't wanna fucking play on anything, man, I've been working all day. He goes, no, you gotta play on this. Uh, and my friend Josh Leo, who's a great guitar player, who's now a producer in Nashville for years and years, he was ill that night and he couldn't be at the session. So there were one guitar short. The song was, Kim Carnes, Betty Davis Eyes. Okay? And I'm walking in, I'm going, I don't want to fucking play on anything. And Val goes, well, come listen to it. And I went, oh yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, okay, I know what to do on this. And I just played eighth notes all through it. And I did this, that sound at the end that you hear, that sounds like a dog barking. It's just my hands on the fretboard doing that. But, you know, I sat down. And again, another example because Val was Peter's engineer. So Val applied the same theory. Everything on that record, Betty Davis Eyes, is live. Everything. Every sound you hear on that record is live. And we cut that song. And when we walk, we're walking in to listen back to it, I looked at Val and I went, you know, this is a smash. I got to tell you, Val, this is a fucking smash. I said, I don't bet, but... I bet you this is a fucking smash, man. Yeah. It's incredible. And we came in the booth and heard it back, and it was magnificent. And, and the greatest thing was my dear brother, Nico Bolas, if you know that name. Nico is an incredible engineer producer who I've been working with. We've all been working with for years and years. <clears throat> he grew up in the studios with us. He's like 10 years younger than I am. We... Uh, he played, when he played back that rough mix for us that night, um, after that, they tried to mix it, and it just wasn't happening. The, the rough mix is the record. Wow. Nico's, Nico's rough balances that he threw together on the monitor board is the record. See, that's when engineers were artists in their own right, man. And wow. Yeah. 
Dude, okay, so that's so so first of all, okay, so you took he to So your- that's a that's a distraction, but normally yeah. yeah, you I would go there and have a drink and settle down, you know, before I'd even go home. You know, you after you've been in the box for all day, you know, you go home and like have conversations. You know, it's like uh, it's just too much, you know. Or I come home and there's music playing, I'm going, Oh god, no, please. Like you either have talk radio or the radio's off, right? Yeah, radio's off, or you know something, something, something you like, not too loud, you know. Yeah. Or, or it's something you like that's real loud. Like sometimes I couldn't wait to get in the car to hear Powerage, ACDC, you know, blast yeah. that shit at myself, you know, after yeah. a day of ballads, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that man. See, this is you are the epitome of a true career musician, brother. Man, you did it all, and you're still doing it all. I love that. Still doing it, hopefully. Hey, man, you are. All right, so real briefly, and I, I don't care. I'm not much on gear. I love gear. I have a bunch of gear. I know you have tons of gear, but I'm not a I gear. <laughs> okay, so that's what I was going to ask you. What's your rig? What's your main rig? Your, your staples? First of all, uh, I don't use any pedals, so um, I have a Les Paul. I have several Les Pauls. That's my main axe. I have Pauls and Strats and yeah. uh, Tele and, and you know, some beautiful acoustics. And basically, uh, that's it, babe. Uh, I use a volume pedal because I, I, I spent a lot of my early years doing what I called my phony steel guitar on, on records in L.A. Uh, that's how I made money was doing this phony. I'd come in and just plug into the board and uh, use a volume. I said, give me some, put some treble on it and, and put some reverb on it. And I studied enough country songs to learn a couple of moves that sounded like steel guitar. You'll hear it on uh, on Randy Newman's song uh, "Rider in the Rain." That's I know I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, yeah. So that's it. So that was it. But I don't uh, I don't use like I said I don't use pedals. You know my to my ear, I've always been. Even when I was a kid, and you get an MXR pedal, you know, but as soon as you plug into it. It's altered the sound, you know. There's these transistors in that unit that have taken that wood and wire and tube sound and changed it. They've altered it. It becomes a brittle version of it. And I, I heard it right away. I never liked it. And I'll use pedals in the studio, but a lot of times someone will go, "Yeah, use it. Put some phasing on it." I said, "Why don't you put some phasing on it in the booth?" You know. You do it because I, I don't have anything, so I don't have pedals. I don't own any. You know what do you want from me? I don't have. I have a Wawa pedal. That's a, that's a unique thing. You know, Wawa is a unique thing. Um, sure. Volume pedal that's a, for beautiful stuff or for steel stuff. Yeah. You know, I did a lot of. I I always did, either the steel thing or just single note things with volume pedal, very loud guitar, real distorted. So it would sound like a cello, sound like a nasty fiddle line, you know. So I would use it like that. But my rig is, uh, I was using Marshalls for a long time. Um, I was using, let's put it this way. When I was on the road with Linda, Music Man 210 HD was the amp. Fantastic amp. Great. I'm looking at my Music Man right now. I have a Music Man head. Yeah. Is that right? It's a, uh, (laughs) It's uh shit. It's a one hundred RD. Oh, far out. Okay. How old is that? Oh, it's. I think it's seventies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. We, yeah. so we had the that was it. The Music Man eight, two ten HD was the one, and then after that, that stuck around for a while. Then I got to when I started working with Stevie, the bands were getting louder and louder, and my amp was getting softer and softer. So <laughs> then I'd have two of them. Then I had four of them, and it still wasn't loud enough, you know, because I just wasn't getting over all these fucking keyboards. All of a sudden, keyboards became very prominent in, in her show. It was like piano and organ, or synth and organ, and a lot of level of, you know. So then I, I went for a uh, boogie amp for a while, just for volume's sake, but I never loved it. Uh, you know, some people sound great in those things. It's, it's like, for me, uh, I'm a Les Paul player. A Les Paul and a twin, worst combination in the world for me. Doesn't work. A Fender Telecaster and a twin, perfect. Strat, perfect. Les Paul, hey. twin, no good. You know, that's a, but, that's right. but Les Paul and a super reverb, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. 
So on to uh, Marshalls. Then I went to Marshalls. And I was using the Marshalls. Like uh, Edge of 17 is a Marshall. Okay. Straight in. Always straight in. Um, and then Keith Records, Marshall. Um, after that... Uh, Oh, it's funny, yeah. I, uh, the first Marshall I got was from Gilby Clark. Um, and I produced the record on Gilby. And he, when he came to my house to meet, he said, so you like my amp? I went, what? He goes, my amp, my Marshall head. I went, what are you talking about? He goes, it says candy on it, doesn't it? I went, yeah, how'd you know that? He goes, that's my amp. I had to sell it. <laughs> so, and that was a sweet, sweet sound. Of amp. I still have it, but it's, it's pretty beat up now. So I went from those to, um, I asked, I heard Leslie West playing and his tone was beautiful. His tone is always beautiful, but I said, what are you playing through? What are you fucking playing? And he said, Blackstar. So I went with Blackstar for a couple of years and there, the, the amp of theirs that I loved, it was called an Artist 30. And, uh, and, and again, it's got, it's got like two channels. One has volume and tone. The other one has all these fucking knobs. And I, no, no, no. I just use volume and tone. That's it. That's and uh, no reverb, you know, nothing. And so, so, and then uh, from Blackstar, I've gone now to Magnetone. And I've been uh -huh. using these beautiful Magnetones. Yeah, they're by me. Yeah. And, and aside from that, I have an amp that this friend of mine named Steve Deacon made this beautiful 112 hardwired, uh, handwired, beautiful little amp that I use a lot. And sometimes I'll even bring it to, if it's a small club, I'll, I'll bring that instead of the, the, the Black Stars or the Mag because they're, they're loud, those amps. They're very loud. And this one, I can control it. So, but that's it. And I, I don't, like I said, I don't, I don't use pedals. So my yeah. rack is uh, these. You know, on, on Stevie's stage, we will use uh, a couple of pedals only to, when I have to use a Strat, because my, oh, and my Les Pauls have a preamp in them. Some of, them, some of them are pure the way they should be, but my white one that you see a lot has a preamp in it, yeah. and it's the loudest, loudest, nastiest Les Paul in the world. And, but so when I would go to a Strat on stage, it's like, huh? Can't hear it. So we had a couple of you know, pedals to boost it up and things like that. But aside from that, that's it. You know, I don't... Do you, do you, uh, do you, when you go out on, on tour dates, do you like to have a guitar tech? Yes. Okay. And Definitely. have you had somebody uh, steady over the years, or has it changed? Yeah, well, uh, I, in, in town, I've been working with a guy named John Philbrick for, for a long time. He's been doing all the sessions in town with me, and we, you know, we had this ongoing club gigs in L.A. for a long time. That's right. Yeah, and John was always there with me there. And on the road with Stevie, I have a guy named John Taggart, who's a great tech. Not only that, he's an, an amazing luthier as well, and he's built... He gave, it, he gave me this... It's a, a Les Paul 12 string. It's gorgeous. It looks, wow. it's so beautiful. And I'll send you a picture of it, man. I'll send That's you a picture cool. of it. It's very beautiful and it plays beautifully, sounds great, and it's light. <laughs> it's the first Les Paul. Because I don't like those light Les Pauls. You know, oh, they, yeah. I need them to be, I've always had a heavy thing around my neck for my whole life. And <laughs> when I feel those light ones, I go, what is this? Like a toy. But. But uh, the, the, the twelve string is gorgeous, and Taggart's made a couple of beautiful guitars. And he actually made copies of my white one, and they're great. That's awesome. Yeah, he's he's a, a tremendous luthier, and a wow. ter terrific tech on the road. So cool, man. Jeez, man, I could sit here and talk to you for hours, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. I have to I have to say, would you mind if we do like a rapid fire question? I'm just gonna ask you some fun questions. Sure. Stuff that's not necessarily about music. So what's your favorite food? Pizza, Italian food, hot dogs, Chinese, I don't know. Okay. Cooch told me I need to ask you about, <laughs> about pizza. Yeah. About pizza, that's right. Because I said, you know, can you get a good New York pie out here? And it's like, eh. No. No. <laughs> no, you can't. My wife makes fantastic pizza. And, and fortunately for me, out here, there's a little town called Moore Park, and there's this little place called Custom Pie. I'm giving, I'm giving them a fucking ad now. But, <laughs> the, and it doesn't look like a New York pie, but it's delicious. 
Very, very good. Really good. And aside from that, it's very hard to find a good pie, man. Isn't it? And see, we call it pie at New Yorkers. It's a good pizza pie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite place in New York? Oh, man. I mean, I haven't lived there in so long. I don't know, because now with the whole resurgence in Brooklyn, there's all kinds of new joints. Yeah, that's true. But my favorite yeah. joint still, I mean, the places that I've loved are all gone now. But yeah. Joe's Pizza, on, Joe's. on, but on not the one in Carmine, the original one, but the one on 14th and 3rd is like heaven. That's the one that Cooch said. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There you go. It's, it's, 14th it's and 3rd. <laughs> so yeah, but that you know, a gr good grilled hot dog or uh, you know, Italian food, perfect, perfect pasta. You know, it's good. Yeah, I love it. it. Your it's favorite it's libation? libation? Was that booze? You mean? Yeah, your favorite drink. Lately, uh, gin and tonic. Or I lived on I lived on vodka for many years. Chopin oh, yeah. Chopin vodka. Uh, oh, very good, good stuff. very good stuff. But uh, yeah. as Keith called it. Uh, I said one night, I'm sick of vodka. I don't know. I, I want something else. He goes, what do you want? I said, you know, I, I actually, gin and tonic. I like the taste of it. He goes, why do you want a Gilbert? A Gilbert? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep that for yourself, though. Don't, don't, don't pass that around. <laughs> that's, that's a special bit. <laughs> that's so awesome. Are you into sports at all? Do you have a favorite sport? Sports? Me? No. Yeah. No. I'm not the same way. <laughs> No, I watch tennis. You know, okay. I watch. I used to like boxing, but that's too violent. Um, right. No, my wife is a, a huge baseball fan, so I've become a, I've become uh, a, a adapt adept at watching baseball. And, there you go. There you go. Uh, but no, I'm not a sports guy. No. How about exercise? What have you done over the years? You know, because yeah, it's rough our business. Carried a Les Paul around stage. Yeah, that's good exercise. Yeah. That's all I did for a long time, um, yeah. but I, I, you know, not much. Walk. Yeah. I walk. That's good. Well, you're in great shape. Well, thank you. I yeah. Like it. I hope so. Yeah. I try it. I Absolutely. Try it. So uh, when you take those long flights, do you sleep or do you, do you stay active? What do you do on a long flight? Uh, I I don't sleep well on planes, so I just, <laughs> you know, fortunately now. Well, you got an iPad, you can entertain yourself with shit, but uh, That's right. normally I would just sit there and go crazy for however long the flight was. <laughs> you know, I, I, was, I used to drink a lot on the planes because that yeah. was how I would deal with it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, now, you know, I sit there and play Scrabble or Solitaire or Gin Rummy on my iPad. Yeah. Or, you know, listen to, listen to tunes for a while yeah. till, till the, till the in-ears hurt, you know, start hurting. I know, right? All right, speaking of listening to music, what's the last thing you listened to that you did not write, produce, or play on? Pretty Ballerina, Left Bank. Interesting. Pretty Ballerina, Left Bank. You know that song? I'm going to have to look it up. Oh, it's great, man. The Left Bank was a, an amazing group. They did Walk Away Renee. Remember that song? No. No? Okay. Wow. Your assignment is... Walk Away Renee was a big hit for them. Uh, Pretty Ballerina was their follow-up single. Uh, and then there was a song called Desiree that never really made it, but it's awesome. Uh, so aside from, you know, ACDC is one of the things I love listening to, but I've listened to them quite a bunch by now. And uh, fortunately, my wife listens to a lot of music, so I would never even think to put something on, but... The other day, Aretha, Aretha was blasting here. It was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Willie Nile, that's another one I love. Have you, you know Willie Nile? No, no, I'm writing this down. You need to look for a song called Forever Wild by Willie Nile. Uh, Willie is a New York guy, great, great entertainer, great songwriter. One, and I, I, it was funny because I heard this song on the radio and I went out of my mind. I really did. Oh, Muse is another thing I liked. Muse was a very good thing. But... <sighs> Don't you love music? Uh, yeah. Supermassive Black Hole. That song. Yeah. That song put yeah. me over, man. But Willie Nile, I heard this song called Forever Wild. I came home with this smile on my face. Right. And Annie goes, what, what's with you? I said, I just heard the greatest tune, the greatest chorus. So you got to check out Forever Wild by Willie Nile. And it's got a lot of great songs. I will. 
I will. Yeah. Man, so cool. All right. Now, the problem is you can't put on a streaming music channel or the radio or anything without hearing yourself. I mean, you're going to hear yourself. Every other song is going to be you. Yes. <laughs> not, not so much, but, you know, I do wind up there a bunch, thank God. Yeah. yeah. And when that happens, what do you feel like? When you listen, literally, if you're driving in the car and the radio's on and your wife's listening to music and you hear yourself, what do you do? Do you chuckle or do you like, ah, do you turn it off? Do you enjoy it? I enjoy it for sure. Good. I chuckle. Good. I chuckle. It's like, you know, I'll tell you, man, sometimes I'll sit in my studio and look around me. I have a very nice place. My wife loves me. We've been married a long time, 30 something years. It's awesome. We have animals. We have, we have a life, you know, and... I'll look at this pick that's in my hand and go, this is all because of you, you know? This is because of this fucking pick in my hand, you know? So. That's amazing. What a blessing, right? Yeah. Pretty wild. Yeah. Words, of, words of wisdom. You have given us so many words of wisdom. I mean, so grateful, Wadi. And listen, I'm seriously going to consider coming out to Ventura just so I can be your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me know if you're coming, man. <laughs> I am. I'm going to pick your brain all the time. <laughs> all right, no, man. Good one, man. Thank you so much, brother. Download, subscribe, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast platforms. I'm just a nomad, nowhere man. Writing the songs in this one man band. A nomad. Hey, this is Nomad, host and creator of the Career Musician Podcast, and I am thoroughly stoked to be an official member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Pantheon Podcast Network is the first of its kind as an all-music-based podcast collective. Please be sure to check us out at pantheonpodcast.com for more info.